So, my curiosity question for you is, have you ever been told you need to share your story? Let me ask you this question again. Have you ever been told that you have a story that needs to be shared? Okay, let me set the tone. You sit there, staring outside the window and watching the rain. And you watch the rain fall, all the while thinking about how strange it is that the weather kind of reflects your feelings and how maybe you're feeling gloomy inside or it feels like there's a shadow that has been cast upon you and you feel this downside, this self, which usually sees the positive in all things, but all you can see is the darkness everywhere. You weren't like this before, nor have you ever felt this down. So you find yourself asking, what happened? What changed? Well, life happened, and it brought along several complications. You didn't see it coming before, but everything goes by, and it tastes bitter. And you don't know how to get through it. Well, you make art out of it. That's what you do. Neil Gaiman has once said that when something bad happens to you, when it's a hardship, your struggle, your test of adversity, make great art. And if you're someone who has gone through hell and come out the other end, this episode is for you because my own definition of passion is not doing something you love, but by taking something that you have struggled with and turning it into a business, turning it into a message, turning it into something that you can share with the world and help others through their own hell. Because when the market demands it, you're ready to make business. And if at all this is resonating with you, then this is totally for you to listen to. Because my guest today is Manny Wolf, and he teaches you how to connect to every single person that you come in contact with, how to actually connect with your storytelling, how to not just be a lecturer, but a true communicator. Manny Wolf was an author of the international best-selling personal memoir, The Tile of the Unbreakable Man, and he is a sought-after public speaking coach and creator of the Thousand Speakers Academy, whose mission is to train 1,000 of the next great speakers and leaders. And this means you, especially if you're going through that hell. But I know for a fact you can come out the other end. So without further ado, enjoy this interview and conversation with myself and the one and only Manny Wolf. Hey, Manny, man. Hey, Logan. How are you, man? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Doing great. And um, <clears throat> ready to step my game up after that intro. Nice, nice, man. <laughs> uh, dude, you will. Uh, you're one heck of a speaker, my man. I've listened to a pu- couple of your podcast interviews and just your your way of communicating uh, is, is very, it's different than most because what you've been able to do is uh, take someone that feels like they don't have a story and uh, they're not being heard and actually have that person connect um, because you've gone through heck and I want to kind of go through your story a little bit. Um, we don't, I know you have many stories and we could probably talk about it for the next three hours. <laughs> uh, but I want to first just kind of start off with, uh, you know, scratching your own itch is, is by having that problem that you had with yourself. And by just solving it, you're actually making other people's lives better or you're creating a business out of it even. Um, When I ask you that question, what does that mean to you? So what's the question exactly? Because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great stuff in that seemingly simple thing you just said that I could expand upon. Yeah. So like, for example, I know that uh, you are a a, uh, recovering addict. And mm-hmm. so by just having an engagement with someone about their alcoholic problems, maybe, sure. or, or problems with alcoholism, 
uh, you're you're actually monetizing it, and you're and you're turning it into meaningful money that I call it, not just making money because you need to like survive off of it, but you're making meaningful money out of it. Um, so any any story maybe with alcoholism or maybe um, how you have problems with women. I mean, any of that, go for it. <laughs> Well, something that you said earlier um, uh, that uh, you borrowed from Neil Gaiman was you make art out of your challenges, out of your – well, I don't want to say – suff. well, it is suffering until you understand that suffering is a choice. Um, so it, it is suffering. And if you're listening out there and you're saying, hey, fuck you, suffering isn't a choice. I'm suffering right now, and it's not a choice. I am very sorry to tell you the suffering part is – the, the things that happen to you that life sort of serves you up that you don't necessarily have control over is not a choice. Suffering is an option, right? You can choose to suffer over it or you suffer over it because you don't know how not to. But uh, that alone could be a whole different conversation, I suppose. Here, here's the thing about what you said and what Neil Gaiman said and and sort of my life and how they all kind of intersect um, there's an alchemy that happens in saying a thing, in telling a story, in taking something from the thought realm to the word realm. There's an alchemy. And so you're right. Neil Gaiman's right. Everyone else who has ever said that in any way is right. Um, it does make art out of it. And there's another level to the alchemy too, which is where just putting it out in word, in particularly in writing, facilitates a healing process and a, a transformation. You know, like I, I like the word alchemy because it's like, it's as if the suffering, the story, the thing that you're, you're experiencing that is something you don't like is the base metal and through the act of clarifying it and speaking it and writing it, it turns into gold. So the next level to that is that you can then start to, you know, in, in a lot of cases, I suppose for most of the people listening to this, start to share that story. Then the next level of alchemy happens, maybe to keep the uh, base metal to gold analogy going, maybe it goes from like 10 karat gold to 24 karat or whatever the purity levels are. But it gets purer and purer and purer and cleaner and cleaner. The interesting thing about that is if for something to become more pure, that means the impurities have to fall away. But in this analogy, the impurities are in a very real way your attachment to living the story. So in other words, what falls away is the power the story has over you. I like to say that when I wrote my book, I took the teeth out of all the traumas and all the drama and all the chaos and the danger and the everything that I lived through. I took the teeth out of it all. So some of it was alcoholism and drug abuse. Some of it was, um, you know, I was sort of, I was sort of raised to think. Uh, that sex and then, you know, for me, women were, um, I don't know. I, I was definitely raised to flaunt the established norms of, you know, bonding deeply with one person, monogamy, those kind of things. And so I just ran around indiscriminately, uh, basically sleeping with whoever would have me with no, no concern whatsoever for the damage it did to people's relationships, to people's you know, to my friends who who I would sleep with their girlfriends, to strangers who wanted to kill me because I slept with their girlfriends. It was, it, it's a funny thing to look back on now because now it could easily be construed as humble bragging. And I get that. But, you know, if you're listening to this and you think it's a humble brag, you know, I l let me assure you it's not. I strained to the point of breaking many meaningful friendships because I had no boundaries around that stuff. And that's owing to the way I was raised. I was also raised in an environment where drinking wine and smoking pot 
uh, you kids today call it weed, I think. I don't know what you call it now. But um, <clears throat> that those things were normal. They were par for the course. And so I took that and like any good artist, I took it and I iterated on it. And I said, well, if those things are okay, then uh, psychedelics are okay. Methamphetamines are okay. Pills are okay. And so by the time I was about 15 or 16, I had a full on sort of multi-purpose addiction. Um, I think from the first time I drank at 12 years old, I didn't have a sober day until I was right before my 28th birthday. So all of this is to say that uh, this was the life I was leading and there was violence and crime and homelessness and destitution and, and drug dealing and all the, all the other things that you might suspect would go with something like that, incarceration. Um, and I couldn't see the forest for the trees, right? Like, I mean, we're talking here ostensibly about storytelling. I, I couldn't even tell that story because I was living it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I put you on mute. I just wanted to make sure that you uh, didn't hear anything in the background while you <laughs> deliver that awesome value. Yeah, it does. Because stories, uh, to me, it's like philosophy, right? Uh, where it seems great on paper, but to actually live it while you're living through it, uh, it's really hard. And so, yeah. you, you, and, and that's why I think speaking, though, is, is such an important, incredible thing that people can start to do to not only heal uh, other people, but heal themselves while they do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, that's the beauty of the art form is it's one of the ways that you can heal yourself by helping other people to heal. And that's very powerful. That's very synergistic. You know, um, I don't really train sort of old school keynote speakers as much. What I want to train as I, as you said in the intro, is leaders, world changers, um, people who are here to do big things, who have big goddamn goals, right? Dream big and you need the levers through which to sort of um, create that big impact. And speaking, of course, is one of those. So the people that I train are the people who, to use a, a marketing cliche, want to turn their mess into their message, but again, we, we, we come back to that idea that um, there, there's so much internal stuff that happens when you commit to that process. You don't just get up on stage and share and inspire people. You heal yourself through the process, right? In sharing the story, every time you share it, it becomes a little more sort of separated from you. And when you separate, we go back to that analogy of the gold. You're the gold becoming a purer and purer level because you're sort of releasing, stripping away the impurities, which are the attachment to the very stories that you're now sharing. Gosh, wow. Uh, wow, that is really, um, that is huge. I think for me, my mind's kind of blown about that, uh, that ideal that you implement in your own practition. And I think it is, it is a practition uh, because if you don't know how to teach someone uh, correctly and how to communicate to that student um, individualistically to that person instead of like trying to teach your whole class the same way, it doesn't yeah. work. Um, but hey, we're, we're here. We're listening to someone that probably has a story to it behind all this and how we got <laughs> into this. Um, <laughs> and you giggle because I know it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. and, uh, I would love though for just pick that one story that you really know that, uh, needs to be shared right now that you can, can connect to all of this. And, um, let's, let's play uh, Steve jobs, connect this dots going backwards now. Brilliant. Okay. Fantastic. So for me, there was 28 years of not knowing how to live. There was 28 years of drug abuse, uh, indiscriminate sex, uh, shirking all authority and responsibility. I mean, I was literally taught, don't worry about anything. The UFOs are going to come fix the planet and it'll be utopia. You don't have to do anything. That's what I was, that's what I was taught from birth. So, so pretty out there, pretty, pretty far from any kind of functional philosophy for how to, you know, be part of a society. Um, 
And so I took it, you know, I was like, okay, I won't worry about anything. I'll just be, uh, I'll just be an avatar of this new utopia that I've been taught is going to come. I'll just party all the time. I'll drink all the time. I'll just be like that guy who's always having fun 24 seven. And of course it doesn't, it's not sustainable. But what's interesting is after 28, after the big turning point, what I call the uh, pinnacle story, and I'm going to move through that quickly. Basically, I found myself, you know, I started out in the garden, metaphorically, where everything was hunky-dory and fine, and I was just this guy who was just like free love and partying all the time with not a care in the world. And as particularly drug abuse will do for you, I found myself on the dark side of all that where uh, everything came to a head when I was, you know, told this story a thousand times now, basically found myself holding a gun and making plans to kill someone. So that's a far cry, you know, from <laughs> from what I, what I set out to do. And I've decided not to, and instead I again, figuratively, completely jumped off a cliff with faith. I just, I said, I'm going to just disappear from my whole life. Everything I've known, the boundaries of my reality, I'm just out of here because I'm not ready to kill someone. So I disappeared and that was the turning point for me. I'd love to tell you that's the time that everything got better, but that's the time the real work started. And so, um, <clears throat> During that work, one of the main questions I asked myself was, how the hell did that, how did I get there, right? Because, you know, I, I saw myself throughout my whole life more as the guy I am now, someone who works hard to serve other people, someone who has a lot to deliver and a lot of value and who wants to kind of raise the playing field and like all these idealistic kind of altruistic goals and that person inside me watched me be an irresponsible, you know, philandering <laughs> drug addict for all those years. And he never had a say in the matter. So the minute that I got free of the drugs, I started asking myself these questions. One of the questions I asked for a long time, years, was what can I do that, what can I do? What can I do that will allow me to use all my skills force me to develop new skills and be a lifelong discipline, a lifelong learning, and also allow me to serve as many people as I can at the highest level I can. You know the drill. Um, I want to serve. Can I, just, can I just say that it is actually really scary to ask yourself that question? Because well, I that think that's why it took me so long to answer it. Yeah, because you're saying no to so many other things. Well, I didn't know that at first either. That's a great, a great observation. Um, and nobody was around to tell me, you know, you have to say no to all these things to say yes to this. Um, I was like most people at the mercy of uh, economic forces and social forces. I had to find work. I had to, you know, try to have relationships and all of this stuff. Um, but that's neither here nor there now. If I had known what I know now, then I would have been single-minded in pursuit of one thing. So after probably asking myself that question for a solid 10 years and, you know, realizing a lot of other things along the way, what I finally distilled it all down to was communication. So for me, it was like, what led me to that moment and that, that visceral moment in my life? Well, it was the way I was communicated with as a baby, as a little boy, as a teenager, as a young man. Um, it was the way that I internalized that communication and then communicated with myself. It was the way that that self-communication prompted me to communicate with other people. Like it's the aperture, right, through which our entire reality passes. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, put you on mute again. Uh, no, <laughs> I just, absolutely. I don't, I don't know that people. Communication is a funny thing. It's got a catch twenty two built into it because we all do it all the time. We are in the most communication rich uh, time in history that has ever existed, and yet nobody, very few people, seem to really understand the power of it. We take it for granted because it's omnipresent. And nobody really understands the the tremendous power that it has. So when I when I realized that it was all down to communication, I said to myself, 
would it be worthwhile to spend my life dedicated to mastering communication? And that even took more years for me to answer because I was, without even realizing it, I was working against the judgment and the wishes and the sort of opinions of my blood family, whom up until a certain moment that you know of, because you read my book, but the listeners don't know of, I held my family's opinions as gospel, even though they judged me all the time, even though they were critical, even though they were impossible to please, right? I just thought they're the people I have to fit in with. They're the people I have to please until another cathartic moment, which it doesn't really matter to this story because what I want to convey to people is the answer finally came to me after years and years and years of asking the question, communication. That's what led me to writing the book. That's what led me to training people to speak. That's what led me to narrow down my focus, not to keynote speakers, but to these world changers, these people who have been on the front lines of the murky darkness of life and who now want to help others. I want to empower them. That's my fucking goal. Wow. Wow. And, uh, gosh, it, it, see, that's the thing is it's, um, I'm, I'm like kind of in awe right now because of you being able to find all of the culmination of the lessons you've learned through the hardships and struggles you've, uh, went through and actually go, I need to find one target to aim my learnings and all this that I've gone through and just aim fire and let it stick. And, uh, you know, we've talked off air uh, about like, you know, what you love doing and you say coaching, coaching uh, people and coaching them specifically how to actually uh, get, get them engaged uh, with their audience and get them engaged with, um, not just sharing a message. And, you know, I kind of talked about earlier, not being just a lecturer because I think, uh, you need to have a conversation. It's communication that you call it the communication instead of just a, a speaker. Um, yeah. So let's get into that a little bit. Let's take some, let's, let's take and talk about the process, which I love. I know you love process too. And sure. let's talk about like, all right, how does someone find that message? Uh, you know, is there an exercise that you do with them? There's, there are a few things. Um, and it depends on the level of commitment that you are ready to make and follow through on. The biggest level that I know of that I could help somebody with would be, you know, write your life story in the form of a book, like make it, don't worry about brevity. Don't worry about fitting it into 10 pages or a hundred pages, you know, write the whole thing out. And it's super important when you write it. And this is where people struggle so much. You may not, you cannot, you must not ever write it from the perspective of being a hero or a victim. You can't do either. They're off limits. Your only job is to tell the truth as closely as you can remember it. It's what I call your emotional truth. Tell the emotional truth, right? Because you'll never get the truth 100%. And you'll also, by the way, you'll have to, (laughs) you're going to have to talk, you know, you're going to have to say some heavy things about other people. Um, So change names. (laughs) That's just, (laughs) that's just a pro tip. Change the names to protect the guilty. But more than that, like if if we were to think of, say, my family, they don't agree with a lot of the things that I wrote. And at some point it becomes like gaslighting. You know, it becomes like, you know what, I have to stop entertaining the argument that maybe I'm not right. I know what I feel and you can't keep telling me what I feel is wrong. Right. Because you can just spin out forever there. So you write your whole life story. And I have a beautiful formula I use for that. I call it the question mark model for storytelling. Um, I don't know if we have time to go into that here. So I'll just, I'll just tease people with that. But what it does is it combines the hero's journey, which we're all pretty familiar with, with a whole other portion that makes the hero's journey make sense. Because like the hero's journey is misunderstood and misused. In my case, the hero's journey doesn't start really until I had that moment where I was holding the gun and contemplating killing someone and then changed my mind and disappeared. 
right? That's when I metaphorically left home. It's not about when I really left home. The, the metaphor for leaving home in the hero's journey is when you have the awareness that changes your thinking and sets you on a path. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so everybody talks about the hero's journey, but they, they sort of inappropriately stretch it across their whole lives and it doesn't belong over your whole life. So you've got to know what that other part, that back history, as I call it, is, how to do it and how to do it in a way that makes it powerful for people when you come to that pinnacle story. So a- anyway, there's a lot more that goes into it. The next thing that people struggle with the most, that is the most powerful and cathartic, is learning how to tell your story. It's what I call revealing universals through your specifics. And it, it's about 90% art, 10% you know, sort of strategy. But the idea, Logan, is this. You have to be able to tell your story in such a way that you're deliberately connecting your experiences to the broad hu- uh, themes of human experience. Because if I was to tell you that I was born in a cult and moved to a ghetto and had to fight every day, everybody goes, wow, that's messed up, right? Everybody, even people who had it worse than me, you know, but very few people can actually relate to that. Does that make sense too? You following so far? Yeah, yeah. So I've got to tell that. Taking notes. (laughs) I've got to tell that in a way that I am deliberately connecting to some broad human themes, such as feeling like the outsider. You know, not being welcomed, um, feeling unprotected, right? These things are are deeper themes. They're broader themes. They're things that whether you went through the same exact circumstances as me or not, we all know about feeling like the outsider. We all know about not being welcomed by by a group of people, right? We We can all relate to that. You see that in every teen angst movie since The Breakfast Club. And the reason that some movies, by the way, I was just talking with my wife about, and no spoilers, why Infinity War was so good. Why was it so incredibly heart-wrenchingly good? And it's because they did that. They did that through the whole movie. They connected these outrageous circumstances, this, this like mad Titan who comes to earth to destroy everything to like very real human experience themes. That's why comedy is so hard because it's, it's being able to take a very, very true thing for everyone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when people get that sort of like, (laughs) and that is so true, man, like, you know, and, and the same thing goes with, with, I think drama and, uh, the same thing goes with just like you were saying, those universal laws where people listen to it and they go like, you know, Hey, I, I, I don't know if I, uh, love that guy, but dang it. I really relate with him. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and usually what happens is if you connect solidly enough to those universal human themes, people don't question whether they love you or not. Like you validate them so powerfully. And if we're all basically some level of us is is, you know, uh self-interest operating, then being deeply validated by someone uh, serves our self-interest powerfully. I love it. Man, yeah. Uh, um I, dude, I wish we could go a little bit longer. I just want to get into scratching the surface curiosity questions. Uh, sure. Which is, because I think you already did a really great job of giving someone uh, some exercises already to do. And mm-hmm. I mean, I was just taking notes just now and I'm like, okay, what, all right, uh, I could do this tonight. Uh, I'm so excited. <laughs> so, so I'll put that in the show notes um, as an, a little outline that people can do. And then, so the first, uh, this question that I, I, I try to ask most of my guests, uh, it's a question that's um, just so, just to ask you to make someone out there feel a little bit less alone, which is, um, you know, what's a thought that you had about yourself, or maybe it was about someone else that you feel kind of embarrassed or ashamed about having, but you know it's just a thought. I, I think I need a little more clarification. I think I need a little more clarity than that. What are we going for here? So, uh, <laughs> um, 
so the 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 thought you know it's like you had a thought about yourself like you know i i looked in the mirror today and i'm ugly I looked oh in the man mirror, god you know, that, that kind of stuff yeah so that that kind of stuff is is best seen as an unavoidable part of the terrain that we experience as living okay I know that especially with the rise and advent of social media, that it can look to us like other people are living these idyllic lives and other people don't judge themselves and other people don't have scars and imperfections. And it, it's, it's just not true. It's part of the experience. So, you know, I have those thoughts all the time. Um, and I just, I just always try to put them in that perspective, in that context, you know, like, and I'm lucky in a sense because I'm a little older now and, uh, my vanity has, has cooled quite a bit. I mean, I used to just be insufferable. I was, I was, even my friends like couldn't stand me at points because I was so vain and so cocky. Um, I really try not to do that, but those kind of thoughts happen where we, you know, I look at people all the time in my, in my social media sphere world, and I fall for the same thing over and over again. Like the people who seem to have, you know, made it overnight, right? That's a big one. Or the people who are offering the super easy new way to get everything you want pretty much without ever doing anything. And, you know, if I was to like directly speak to the listeners, I would say, you have to understand it's just part of the experience that those sort of self-judgment thoughts come up and those judgments of other thoughts come up and those thoughts of comparison to others. It's not about not having them. It's about what do you do with them? You know, do you let them consume you or do you realize that we all get them? It's just part of the, the game. Dude, you're a true teacher. That is, uh, that is excellent, excellent uh, advice. I would... <laughs> Yes, I would love to put that on a billboard for a lot of people to to read. <laughs> totally. no, absolutely, like hundred yeah. um, percent. The next question I'd love to ask you is uh, sort of uh, what is a person that you wish you could have on your own podcast? Because I know you have a podcast of your own um, that really has just uh, been a, a real mentor of yours. And maybe you haven't even met this person because they're no longer living. Uh, yeah, who's that? Uh, it would have to be Stephen Covey, who, who, as of only a few years ago, is no longer living. He was the biggest influence on me, my work, um, the biggest engine for me changing the way I think was uh, the seven habits of highly effective people. Still, in my opinion, the granddaddy of all self-help or business books or both. Like just, whew, I have seen... And I'm not judging these people negatively either, but I have seen people take a thin slice out of what he teaches in that book, make it their whole career, serve people on a high level with it and thrive. You know, I mean, it's just, it's so much in there. I have read and listened to that book easily a hundred times, easily, probably more. Uh, if there was one person, especially with the, um, you know, he calls it the internal victory. I, for me, it's the self-awareness and self-communication piece. But, uh, you know, he helped me to clarify and develop a lot of what has become the framework for not only what I do with people, but the whole way that I live. Wow. Wow. Yeah, dude, uh, I will. I have to comment on this real quick and say that I can tell you're just a passionate guy. Like meaning <laughs> like like you take something and you run with it. Yeah. And it's it's a, a the reason why I pointed out is because it's rare nowadays that are there are people that just take one thing and they run with it. Um and, and sometimes it doesn't happen until you're older. Some people are very blessed and they find it when they're young. Uh and so I'm just gonna say like right now I, I find you a very passionate person, but I just wanna ask you uh, two more questions, and then we'll leave you off, and uh, we'll let everyone else that's uh, enjoying this to actually start having the fun and the play and doing the homework assignments that uh, we've given out. And, and uh, so just two more questions, and I'll let you go. 
Sounds good, man. Awesome. Uh, the second to last question is, anybody that's listening to this right now, uh, how can they support Manny Wolf? Best thing you could do is just come and ask for permission to my Facebook group. It's number 1,000 Speakers Academy Facebook group. The 1,000 Speakers Academy Facebook group. Um, that's where – that's my hub. That's where everything happens. That's where I communicate with people. That's where I do the most teaching, provide the most value. It's all for me right now. That's a, the huge focus is on developing and cultivating that group. Awesome. Yes. Uh, please go in there and check it out. Great group. I'm a part of it. It's, uh, it's one of those things where there's not, there's not this like fluffy talk. It's, it's real talk. So get in there and and let's do some myth busting with what it is to be a speaker and, and to be totally. a world changer. Um, so I'll put that in there as well in the show notes. Uh, and the last question I'd love to ask is uh, because there's trade offs in everything in life. Like one at one point you've got your health going for you, but then your business is bad, or you know you got business going thriving, and there's a trade off for your health. And uh, so I want to just ask you, Manny, um, what have you had to sacrifice for your success? Man, that's a great question. Um, so imagine, <laughs> imagine you're you're standing in the middle of a room, and you've got, let's see, health, wealth, relationships, um, emotional health. You've got four babies, and they've all just learned to crawl, and they're all going different directions. Like that's how I sort of manage balancing all those things. For one minute, I'm over here making sure that this one is okay, but then the other's crawling away. So I got to like focus over here a little bit. Um, I would like to dispel the myth that that balance in all of those areas is something that you can sort of reach, achieve, and keep. I just don't think that's realistic at all. I think it's way more liquid or fluid than that. You know, it's like okay, so like for me, for instance, I've been working very, very hard for the last few months on my business, on the wealth. And then I realized, huh, like my energy kind of feels bad. Oh, it's because I'm working out two times a week instead of five times a week, you know? So, okay, let's, let's figure out, even if it means just getting up from my desk and doing pushups, let's figure out how we can get some more exercise in there. Um, I am real fortunate in the, in the relationships department, because I work from home, my wife works from home, and we like get along ridiculously good. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and I say it like that because honestly, I never, ever, 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 ever thought I'd have that. My, my life was just one conquest and one bad relationship after another, down hundreds of lanes of failure, <laughs> and to finally find someone that um, that is so compatible and enriching and rewarding. It's just mind blowing. So that one, that would be the baby that's well behaved in this analogy. <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, there's, again, let's use social media as a mirror, right? There, everyone is reflecting this horseshit idea that you just, you reach, achieve, and then maintain this balance in your life. No, you don't. No, uh, -uh absolutely not. You know, you just, you have to pay attention to things. You have to be fluid. You have to know what you value in each moment and what you prioritize in each moment. And, uh, and then that's how you do it. Wow. Ah, oh, gosh, this has been a wonderful conversation. I, I just have to say that the last point is, is the way you, you communicated liquid. It's not a balance thing. It's a, uh, of, of happiness or whatever this thing, whatever you may, uh, want they say that everyone wants one thing and it's happiness but it's so elusive and it's it is very liquid and uh is it's very hard to achieve balance of of all things being great and uh, i think we're actually lucky as a human species to have problems uh, rather than just you know everything being great and grand and stuff like that so to really uh, think of that thing that you really wish you had more problems in, I think is a cool way to kind of look at it. Um, yeah. So Manny, I love this conversation. I can't wait to, uh, share it with people. And also, uh, honestly, let's stay connected, man. Uh, you're doing incredible work and, and you continually, uh, you're like one of my uh, heroes for sure. Just always being there to respond 
whenever I have a question. So um, thank you. Absolutely, man. And a really great job, really great job with this interview. You know, I've, I've done hundreds of them and um, not all of them are, <laughs> not all of them are winners. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. So good work, buddy. Ah, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I appreciate that. Well, uh, we'll be uh, staying in touch, man. Okay, brother.